ABX's Descartes District, uh, which is home to the Baptiste Deposit, which is the, where they've got the economic studies on. Uh, we're going to check that out. We're also going to check out the Van Target. This is the where they've been doing the drilling over the last couple of years. Going physically to site can never be beat. You know, they can show you pictures, videos of the, uh, of the site and, and what's around it, but you can never replace being there. And, you know, for me, it's a big advantage or it's a privilege for me to be able to go to site because the vast majority of people aren't going to be able to go there. Uh, to be quite honest, I didn't know uh, a lot about Central BC, specifically Prince George. Outside of what I've been told, I have family who lives in, in BC, not quite Central BC, uh, but has worked out there, has lived out there, and they had uh, you know, a lot to tell me about what to expect from those, those areas. But you know, in saying that, it, until you visit a place, you really don't know what to really expect. The drive from Prince George to Fort St. James was actually quite nice. It's a paved highway, um, and as you're leaving Prince George, you're gaining elevation quite quick. But in that mid portion of your drive, it actually becomes quite flat, and I was actually very surprised to see uh, that part because I didn't expect it, especially because you start in the mountains and then sort of uh, it flattens out. So that was that was quite interesting. And obviously that's where the farming and, and a lot of the uh, residential areas are along that, that flat section. But it's an absolutely gorgeous drive through the mountains and you know, it, I, it never gets old to me. You know, I've been across the country, you know, North and South America and uh, driving through the, the mountains is, is always something that I quite enjoy. Much like Prince George, I didn't know a lot about Fort St. James outside of, you know, some of the basics. It was roughly 150, 160 kilometers away from Prince George. Uh, small, you know, let's say 2,000-ish people. Um, and really it's that kind of hub for forestry and for many mining, junior mining companies in the area. FPX's CEO, Martin Turan, will already be in Fort St. James when we arrive. To me, he's, he's uh, amongst the best in this, this sector. They, they don't come better than Martin in terms of trustworthiness, uh, competence, vision. Uh, Martin's got it all. So we're here in Fort St. James, about a 45 minute drive to a uh, logging road access point. And from there, about an hour and a half or so, along logging roads uh, to right, right into Baptiste, right into the camp. Uh, we'll get a good sense of Baptiste in terms of the scale of it and how it sits in, in respect of some of the logging activities that, that are quite extensive in that area. There's, you'll see crisscrossing logging roads everywhere in areas of clear cut that are quite evident. And that's what allowed us access to the property to do the initial exploration to begin with many years ago. Dakar is around a two hour drive from Fort St. James. You know, the first 45 minutes or so are gonna be along a paved road and then you're gonna get onto the forestry roads. And I think this, this is maybe one of the most important steps for anybody that's on a site visit is seeing where from that hub that you're staying or where, you know, that labor force might be and what their journey is gonna to be to site. When you get to the forestry roads again, you know, how, how, how busy are they, but how developed are they? And, you know, for us, uh, the forestry roads are, are quite in quite good condition, especially the main ones. Yeah, so it really depends on the year, like how active we are at the at the project. This year is pretty low activity. There's baseline studies being done. Um, so really to cause for me to come up to the project itself 
you know, probably three or four, maybe five times this year, usually site visits with various sort of investors or corporate groups that are, that are interested in the company. Um, but then as you move off the beaten path, you know, it's going to obviously get uh, more obscure. And again, as an investor, these are the sort of things that you want to take a look at. Uh, getting out into the middle of nowhere, so to speak, uh, is I always find quite attractive. The cell phone doesn't work anymore. It's quieter. And uh, again, you're, you're out in the, the midst of where this mining operation is going to be. And so, as a, again, as an investor, you need to look at this and, and see if you can picture a mine being here. This is a, one of the big steps for site visits is that, that journey from where your, your, your hub is to where the site is and you need to pay close attention. Baptiste, the main deposit, sits in an area we call the Dakar Nickel District. So it's a, it's a claim area that covers around 245 square kilometers. So Dakar sits within the traditional unceded territories of four uh, local First Nations. So that's Clasden, uh, Binche, Takla, and Yakuchi. Um, so, you know, our history here is, is doing a reconnaissance exploration, in fact, going back to the late 90s, um, but really coming back to the project in 2007, 2008. And a key part of that was, was early engagement with uh, Clasden Nation, um, as well as some of the, those other nations to just, you know, let them know about our reconnaissance activities. And, you know, that, that kind of history of engagement with those groups is really a core part of our, of our company. We recognize that uh, those are the rights holders here uh, and collaboration partnership with those nations is, is kind of central to how we can move this project forward. The journey was, was quite good, especially I thoroughly enjoyed, even though it was work for me, um, I was given the task of calling out the, the road markers as we went. Uh, every two kilometers you have to call out your position and whether you're going up or down uh, the road. And this is as much for you as it is for everybody else that's driving. But it was interesting to, to be in charge of that and I certainly missed my, my share of posts in, in talking and uh, just trying to take in everything else. Uh, but as you get off the beaten path, you get into these, these sub-roads, it's much quieter. And uh, as such, uh, and I'm not even sure besides another pickup truck if we, we saw anybody else once we got into the heart of the car. And uh, that was good. Oh, besides uh, a few bears, um, which was again, another highlight for me. Yeah, you never kind of get tired of coming up to, to somewhere this beautiful. Pretty cool just to get an overall sense of the landscape and you know, how, you know, things like the highway system, the forest service road system, you know, the presence of kind of pretty extensive logging activities interacts with what a conceptual mine would look like as well. It's, it's pretty interesting. One of the objectives of the company over the course of the last couple of years has been to ensure that, you know, our project is on the radar of both the provincial and the federal government. Uh, we've, we saw that come to fruition in, in a way earlier this year, we received some federal government funding um, one of the first companies to get funding under the government's critical mineral strategy to demonstrate the ability to take the nickel that we would uh, produce here and, and make it into a battery grade form to, to feed into the cathode materials for, for electric vehicles. So that, that, that was a great, I think, initial sign of kind of the project being of interest to the federal government. Um, we're also, you know, engaged with the provincial government in helping to feed some ideas through for the development of the Provincial Critical Mineral Strategy. We expect that strategy to be published uh, next year. It's clear that critical minerals and, and EVs and the transition to a low carbon economy is key part of industrial strategy and industrial strategy where the governments are taking a more active role in shaping the economy is, is very much back on the menu in, in, in the United States and in Canada. The site visit is all about verification and whatever you outline in your investment thesis, you can make yourself a list and you're going to check each one of these boxes off. But obviously the physical location and that time with the people are those two big points uh, that you want to prepare for uh, when doing a site visit. When we first drove in, we drove in into where they had their core shack and their kind of residential area where they had, you know, their 
their their cafeteria slash where their tents were set up on platforms. And that's actually going to be in the heart of that Baptiste deposit or the Baptiste open pit. The most important thing beyond that, of course, is the grade, how much nickel is there as a percentage of that, of that overall tonnage of material. So we report the nickel in two different ways. We report the total nickel, which is about 0.21%. So 0.21% of the rock mass is nickel. We also report the Davis tube recoverable or DTR nickel. That is a measure of how much of that nickel is magnetically recoverable. That is of a large enough grain size that it will actually be drawn by an industrial magnet in a, in a commercial operation. That method of measuring mineral content is also common in the iron ore business because they similarly, in what's called magnetite uh, deposits, they're drawing or they're, they're trying to extract magnetically recoverable iron, uh, iron that is in the form that can be, that is attracted to magnets. The investment thesis in FBX is multifaceted. It covers an, an array of, of different factors. I think the biggest one is the fact that it's an awareite deposit. Uh, awareite is different than a, a nickel sulfide, and it's different than a nickel laterite. And it has those aspects of, of its difference are, I think, what are a huge advantage to FBX in the future mining operation that I think it's going to be. Awareite, uh, when it's mined or processed, it'll be the nickel will be separated, uh, you know, from the 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 tailings, uh, but in those tailings, in most other places, it's going to be kind of a, a detriment or a liability. In this case, the brucite that's found in the tailings is actually has the ability to carbon sequester. So you take, so you crush grind the rock, you put it through magnetic separation and then flotation. So flotation is where you're adding chemicals um, and uh, basically based on the mineral content of what you're putting into that flotation cell. Some of those minerals will float, that is they can be collected by chemicals and float to the top and be basically skimmed off the top. And the others, which tend to be oxide minerals, don't float. So it becomes a great way of separating the nickel that you want from all the stuff in the rest of that concentrate that you don't want. Uh, those oxide minerals don't float, the nickel in our case does, we can then skim that off the top and produce this nickel concentrate. So this concentrate is about 60% nickel content, so it'd be the highest grading nickel concentrate in the world from any operation uh, of this type. And the key, one of the key pro properties of it is that it's very low in its sulfur content. There's virtually no sulfur in it. That's important because deposits, mineral deposits that have sulfur commonly associated with them, other things are commonly associated with sulfur. Things like arsenic, antimony, mercury, selenium. These are nasty or deleterious elements that require that, that metal product to then go through a smelting stage. Meaning you've got to clean that material up before it can go downstream and be used in, let's say, making stainless steel or making nickel for batteries. In our case, the absence of sulfur means there's the absence of those nasty deleterious elements and that allows us to bypass that smelting stage and to, to produce a product that can go directly either into making stainless steel or into making batteries. And in this new goal for society to move forward towards electrification and decarbonization, the, the fact that it sequesters carbon um, is, a, is a major factor. The other side to it is that high-grade con can not only skip the smelter, uh, but it's also more nickel per truckload, and that per truckload reduces carbon emissions, it reduces cost. Uh, there's a number of factors that, that lead into why this, is, this difference is a major, major uh, bonus to FPX and its, its potential to be a mining operation in the future. So with respect to batteries, you can take this concentrate and you can put it through a chemical refining process to produce this. Uh, these crystals here are nickel sulfate uh, or NiSO4-6H2O, these beautiful blue crystals. This is the nickel form that you need to make the chemicals that go into the battery of a Tesla. Site fences are the, the verification step of the due diligence process. 
Uh, so everything that you came up with within your investment thesis that you've written down and outlined as reasons why you want to invest in any particular company, uh, you're going to go on this physical trip and visit it and you can verify all those things that you uh, thought were true or they tell you are true are true. So other things that you can look at is you know looking for those outcrops if the deposit does indeed outcrop and look at the samples yourself, see what you can see. Uh, from those rock samples, even if you're not a geologist, the, a geo should be able to take you through maybe, you know, taking a look and seeing the mineralization within the rock itself. Um, and these can be good verification steps that indeed you're, you're looking at a, a nickel deposit or a gold deposit. FPX was initially known as uh, First Point Minerals um, and it was founded by Peter Bradshaw and Ron Britton. Peter's still our, our chairman. Ron was our VP Exploration for a long time. So it was a gold company, a gold exploration company founded in the mid 90s. And they were up here in this part of the world in the, the late 90s looking for gold and uh, prospectors showed them um, some samples of nickel in this sort of novel form of a Werowite that, that uh, they hadn't heard of at the time. They kind of noted it as a bit of a curiosity. And it wasn't until the nickel price really went way up in 2005, six time frame that they kind of dusted those files off and, and came back to the region, did some more reconnaissance work and eventually staked the ground. very fine grained. So the aware white, you know, typically comprises about 90% of the nickel within this is as a wear white. Yeah. But then you can have a fairly wide range of particle size or of grain size. And so the larger the grain, the easier it is to recover. And so oftentimes in outcrop, you'll see the aware white, but, um, you know, it's often going to be very fine grained to the point where it's just barely detectable by the human eye. Yeah. Um, that's giving you a sense that you're in mineralization, that there's a good basis to actually do a drill program. You feel the, the weight, the density of yeah. it. So FPX is doing something new. Uh, you know, we're the first company to have discovered a, a nickel deposit with a primary form of nickel is in this awarewite as opposed to a sulfite or a laterite. And with anything new, there's challenges and opportunities that are uniquely associated with that. You know, when you look at how we trade against the peer group of companies, we do trade at a significant discount on a, you know, on a price against our NAV basis, for example. And I think. People ask me that all the time, why against the peer group are, are we valued lower? And I think it's entirely down to that novelty of doing the, something for the first time. So how are we addressing that or how have we addressed that over the course of the last few years? I'd say there's two ways to answer that. One is in terms of just fundamental technical de-risking, in particular around the metallurgical flow sheet. So the resource is very solid. It's a low grade deposit, but the, there's no real question around the resource. The key question has always been, can you re recover the nickel at a high recovery rate and do it in a cheap and simple process? And that's exactly what our test work has shown, both at that bench scale, but also scaling up to that pilot plant scale where we're treating you know, 18 tons of material. We're now doing a pilot plant that'll be treating 70 tons of material. So these are the volumes that are, that are really demonstrating with greater confidence that that flow sheet works. The other aspect of how you address that is through who else is invested, who else has run the ruler over FPX and said, is this just a science project, but can this actually be a valid, you know, technically and economically robust asset? And so just in the last nine months, we've had you know, Autocompu come in as a major shareholder investing at a 40% premium. They're one of the world's largest stainless steel companies. They're a very sophisticated consumer of nickel, so their investment here is a real validate, validation of the quality of the product we can produce. We've uh, received government funding from the federal government of Canada to continue to demonstrate that we can produce that battery grade nickel sulfate. 
We've gotten, uh, uh, we've put in place a, a exploration joint venture with the Japanese government, with Jogmec. And Jogmec and the Japanese government sees that this Awarewhite style mineralization can be a disruptive new source of nickel for the Japanese automotive industry, which is obviously a key component of that uh, country's economy. I've been an investor in FPX for quite a while. And this site visit was really the culmination of that, you know, four or five years I've been an investor. And so my expectation was quite high on what I was going to see and, you know, the, the layout in terms of, of what I expected um, did meet expectation. Something that surpassed was the van target. And this is, I think, more from a, like a Vista type of uh, expectation. I never expected to see uh, as much of the Dakar property as that we, that we could. And especially from that elevated end crop, I thought it was spectacular. And really capped off the, the trip for me was, was being on that outcrop with, with Martin and everyone and uh, being able to take that in. This is the key where we're standing right here. We've got outcrop, that's bedrock that comes right up to surface. And you can think of this as the, the vectoring tool to try to, on the treasure hunt, of trying to find nickel. This is the sort of that tip of the iceberg. And so you need that tip coming to surface so that you can sample it with this style of mineralization to feel the confidence to then go out and, and execute a drill program. So when you've got this outcrop here, the ability to kind of sample a lot of rocks and when you can stitch that together over hundreds of meters, or even in the case of our targets and deposits, sometimes thousands of meters, it gives you that confidence to then want to go and, and test the third dimension with that drone. It was amazing uh, to go to site today. For, for me, it really brought the investment full circle. You know, FPX has been in my portfolio and been under my coverage in my newsletter for, it's gotta be five years now. And uh, to finally get to site and to see everything that we've talked about and I've seen on paper was a big deal for me. And, uh, you know, for me as an investor, what this is in the process is, it's a verification of everything that we talked about. And I think, you know, for most investors, if you get the people part of the company investment right, typically all that other stuff is going to fall into line. And, you know, these verifications are kind of a formality. And really, it's, it's a good chance for us to spend some time together. And, of course, it's always nice to get to site, to see the topography, to see what that future mine site is going to look like. And if it's, it's actually uh, a practical uh, approach to how it might be developed. Um, so for me as an investor, it's a nice cap on this, this investment process. And uh, I think, you know, it's maybe not available to everybody, but the people that can enjoy it with me and see me go through it, um, I think can, can benefit from it. You know, certainly would like to think that full circle is actually to that ultimate M&A, yeah, right. that, that exit at a much higher valuation. That's, right. that's the true full circle that yeah. we're working towards. But in terms of doing a, a site visit, you know, a lot of the site visits we do are mostly with, with corporates, with large companies that are interested in investing in us or or, or, or something that could lead to a lot more from an M&A standpoint. And, you know, a, a mining project is, not, is a lot more than just the, the mineral deposit and, or a lot more than just the mineral resource estimate that might come out or the studies. It's, it's the three dimensions of, of what building an actual operating mine could look like. And I think one of the experiences that we always have when we show the site to large corporate counterparties is, 
is they quickly see, I think, from the layout of the landscape, from the, the kind of the infrastructure, the way the site could potentially be designed, that there's a mine here. Um, and that it really clicks in a way that it doesn't just kind of reviewing, you know, data in a data room or uh, public disclosures. That to see it there in three dimensions, you can start to envision exactly what a, an operating mine would look like. And, and so making it real to people in that, in that third dimension is, is a huge thing. Absolutely, like, especially today, the highlight was that van target, that sort of vista off that, that high point yeah. that, that really set it off for me um, in terms of encapsulating the whole thing. And especially that's the exploration front, which is really the blue sky for investment in FPX. And I think is definitely something investors need to pay close attention to moving forward. Having things to do outside of the investing world or work uh, is, uh, is big for me. I need something to decompress. I need something to take my mind off of the market, which um, outside of you know, different activities, you know, such as sports, like I love hockey, I love golf, um, I love fishing and hunting. Uh, these sorts of activities completely take my mind off the market and I can't do in conjunction uh, with thinking about a junior company or thinking about a certain metals market. And uh, not only that, but stuff like fishing especially um, brings me back to my own childhood. You know, that relationship with, with my dad and the things that we used to do uh, to have fun on weekends. And uh, I like to parlay that with my kids. It's definitely a, a big part of my life and something that is much needed because when your mind is constantly on, um, you can get burned out pretty quick. This trip to BC, I was extremely lucky to get out on a fishing charter. You know, right in basically Vancouver Harbor and uh, hook into some a huge salmon that I'm not, most of my fishing experiences happened in, in streams or uh, the trout, the trout can be quite fun, but they don't get as big as the salmon. And so hooking into a couple 20 pounds Chinooks and fighting them for you know, 20 plus minutes um, was quite the experience. Investing in something new is something that a lot of investors rightly have apprehension about. Uh, countless times I've, I've done you know, calls with companies and they talk about new mineral processing techniques, uh, new this or new that, and really I shy away from it too. Um, when you have unanswered questions that center around something new in mining or, or probably any type of investing, uh, you wanna be skeptical about it. The thing is when you pick good management teams, that you trust and you think have the technical expertise to execute or have a good plan to execute on answering that unanswered question that's new, um, then I think, depending on what that, that discrepancy between value and potential value, um, you know, that risk can be, you, you should be willing or could be willing to, to take it. Hand off the wheel, hand off the wheel, hand okay. off the wheel.